And at some level, Mr. Speaker, when we are talking about the Born Alive Act, a child born alive being entitled to certain medical care, this is a basic test of humanity. That's the voice of Virginia Delegate Nick Freitas making an impassioned defense of his Born Alive bill. Today, we're going to share some of those emotional highlights with you, the victories and the defeats, and some of the moments that didn't get reported during the 2022 General Assembly. Welcome to Speak Up, Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, and I'm joined today by our Director of Government Relations, Todd Gacky. All right, before we get started here, I have a really important question for both of you, Todd and Catherine. Okay, this is really crucial. What do you guys think about the whole daylight savings debate? Because we know our U.S. Senate had this whole debate at the national level, and they voted unanimously for permanent daylight savings time. And the whole country is debating this topic, apparently. So where do you guys fall on this, Catherine? Personally, I am against it. Why? That is very interesting. I think you're the only person I've heard say that so far. Yeah, I'm one of the only people I know that's against it, too. I like the change. I like it, the break in the monotony. And I like, you know how, you know, naturally things start getting darker earlier and lighter later and whatnot. I like that you have that dramatic change with the hour twice a year because all of a sudden, like, oh, it's so much easier to wake up in the morning or oh, it's so much harder to go to bed early. Like, I like that psychological Or do you change. like the feeling of getting an extra hour of sleep that one time a year? She I'll likes just wake change. up. Yeah, I'll just wake ways. up early. That's the problem. It won't matter. See, for women, I do think this is more psychological because for me, I like the idea of that I can do the fall backwards and get an hour of extra sleep. Uh -huh. I like feeling like that once a year. But then I don't like, I really hate the, the fall or the spring forward um, because I hate that part. So I don't know. I guess if, if I have one change, I have to have the other. So I'm, I'm conflicted. How about you, Todd? I always find it kind of comical when you go to church and you're trying to see who's going to show up late <laughs> or who's going to be there really early in the spring, you know, and they've, they've completely missed the service and are having to show up at the second service. <laughs> To that's catch the an, message. That's an excellent point. We will miss that entertainment yeah. <laughs> with permanent daylight savings time. That's right. <laughs> well, to get into today's topic, the Virginia General Assembly finally is wrapping things up. Now, they have left some things unfinished, like the whole budget, namely, that they are going to have to have a special session, I think, starting April 4th to complete. But for the most part, their work is done, and we never really got a chance to highlight on this show what happened or give a summary of that. And there were lots of dramatic moments that we witnessed, but that didn't get reported, right? Yeah, there were plenty of revealing moments this session, some highs, lows. It, it was kind of an up and down session. But we did see some parental rights legislation get passed. But at the same time, we also saw some disappointing uh, disappointments as it relates to the sanctity of life. Now, when you're in the session like that, are you kind of riding a, a roller coaster, like a huge victory, and then down to a really disappointing thing when they don't pass the pro-life bill? Oh, for certain, yes. Yeah, you get really pumped up when you see these uh, pro-family bills get passed, and then the bills that you're supporting quickly get defeated in a committee, and it is very deflating. Yeah, I won't, I won't lie about that, yeah. So how do you handle the emotional ride? Uh, you take it one day at a time, and you know that you just come back and you keep fighting for, for family values and, and pro-family legislation. Well, we appreciate what you do, Todd. And as you mentioned, there were some pretty big disappointments in the pro-life area. And so one thing I thought we'd do a little different in today's show is kind of share those moments with the audience in their own words, as they say, or straight from the legislators' own mouths, because there are a lot of these floor debates that really didn't get reported, like I said, in the mainstream media like it should. So we're just going to play some of this audio and discuss it a bit. And we're going to start off with this powerful moment from Delegate Nick Freitas. We played a little bit of that in the opener today. Um, and to set this up a little bit more, Todd, can you give us some context with what happened, as you were saying, with a lot of the pro-life bills uh, getting defeated this year? Why was it such a challenge to get any of them through and why was Delegate Freda so upset about that? Yeah, so a lot of the pro-life bills failed in the Senate this year, in particular the Senate Education and Health Committee. 
And this bill actually was moved to a different committee to ensure that it was defeated. This is a bill we're talking about, the Born Alive Infant Protection Act, that would have ensured that if a baby is born alive from a failed abortion, that they're giving the medical care that they need to survive and then taken to a hospital for further further care. Yeah, unlike what former Governor Northam said, where you just leave it on the table and discuss what to do with the baby. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so Delegate Freitas wanted to address that. And so he's trying to get this bill through. And so it got sent to a committee where they could ensure that it was defeated. That's what he called his born alive bill of protections. If the baby's born alive, it, they must have care to resuscitate or mm-hmm. make sure it gets the care That's it right. needs. Um, and so why, why was he so disappointed that he couldn't get bipartisan support on this? Well, I think that this is a bill that speaks to humanity. You know, this is a baby that is living and breathing. It was from a failed abortion. And we can't as a society say that this is life and should be given medical care and taken to the hospital. I think that is what infuriated him the most, but also because there's a personal testimony because they were encouraging his his mom to have an abortion. um, To abort him. To abort him. So he very well, if she listened to them, may not be here today. Right. Well, let's just listen into a little bit more from that clip from Delegate Freda's speech. And before I listen to one more lecture about the least of these among us, about the poor, about the marginalized in society, I would like to think that we can at least agree that in a situation like this, we're going to stand up and ensure that this child gets a basic level of care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think from from this clip, I think what is so encouraging is just the standing ovation that he got. I mean, it's very clear when you listen to it how impactful it was. Uh, But the most important thing is that he promised he's going to bring this bill back. And I can tell you that Delegate Freitas means what he says. And and I really do hope that it does come back because this is an important bill that Virginia needs to have passed. Do you think it will come back next session? Absolutely. All right. Well, we'll pray that that gets through and... (laughs) Um, everybody pray for more pro-life senators. That's right. Well, it's good to talk about the victories as well as the defeats. So without further ado, let's talk about the headway we made with parental rights. Right. So in particular, there were two pieces of legislation that did pass. One dealt with parents having the ability to review sexually explicit material that's being taught in the classroom and given the opportunity to opt out of that teaching and given an alternative lessons. The other bill was a bill to remove the mask mandate for children in school. Not only that, it also ensured that there was an in-person option during a health emergency. Yeah, and the the bottom line thing about these two major victories on parental rights is that it gives parents the final say. The final say on if sexually explicit content comes comes up in your child's classroom, that you make the decision whether they should be exposed to that and if they need an alternative reading assignment. Mm -hmm. And the final stand, whether your child needs to wear a mask or not to school. So I think that set a good precedent moving forward for parental authority in our state. And we did highlight in a previous program how one left-wing representative, Delegate Alfonso Lopez, had the audacity during the debate over the parental rights bill to refer to concerned parents as a vocal minority and, quote, the lowest common denominator. You know, what was frustrating about that is that it's almost as if they learned nothing from the past election about the power of the mama bears and, you know, this parental rights tidal wave that we're seeing across the country. Um, I'm not going to play that clip again today because um, we featured it in a previous episode. But there were also a lot of bright spots, in addition to discouraging comments like that, from delegates like Kathy Byron, who gave an awesome defense of parents' rights to be involved in the classroom. Let's just listen into her comment. Mr. Speaker, I'm almost at a loss for words. When did what goes on inside a classroom become a state secret? Transparency goes hand in hand with the parents' right to oversee the education of their children. Said simply, parents need to be able to be aware of what's being taught in the classroom. You know, what I love about this clip from Delegate Byron is that she really addresses this notion that information by the state is being kept secret in in the classroom and how we can't have that. We need to have transparency. How can parents really effectively direct the education of their children 
if they don't know what is being taught in their classroom. What's also interesting is that she's speaking to this in the context of the governor's decision to set up this this email hotline so that parents and citizens have a way of reporting some of those teachings that do undermine parental values and principles at home. Yeah, and also some of these lessons that are divisive that are propagating things like critical race theory type of themes that parents don't want their children learning that. They want children to learn um, that we should value one another according, as Martin Luther King said, according to our character, not the color of our skin. And that's getting undermined by a lot of these these lessons. They're hearing the opposite things that you should judge each other according to the color of of your skin. So I I um, think it's very concerning that there's this theme of let's keep what's being taught in school secret and not give parents the knowledge of what that information is. We need more transparency. Right. That goes hand in hand with parental rights. Thanks for joining us for Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. If you're enjoying the show, help us encourage others to speak up by giving us a five-star review and sharing it with friends. Thanks for listening. Well, I think we'd be really remiss without highlighting what I like to call the couch potato homeschooling comment. Now, before we play this special clip, give us just a little context about what happened when Senator Janet Howe from the Fairfax area made this comment. Yeah, it was in a Senate Education and Health Committee. It was regarding what we call the Tebow Bill. It was a bill to allow homeschool students the option to be able to try out for public school athletics. And it was a local option. And during this committee discussion, she offers this gem of a comment regarding homeschoolers just sitting at home acting like couch potatoes just sitting on the couch and not doing any real work. Yeah, it's, it was really atrocious, and we're going to play that in just a minute here. But I just want to point out, when you say local options, the school district gets to decide whether this happens. And then you got to consider that these homeschooling parents are already paying taxpayer funds that support the athletics at the local school. Um, so why shouldn't their child be able to participate in that? You know, so. Right. All right. Well, let's listen to Senator Howell explaining her reason for opposition to this bill by quoting a former colleague. Uh, And at one point, I remember your predecessor, uh, Senator Lucas, Senator Potts, uh, going forth on this very bill and leaning over his desk and pointing and uh, saying, my students at Hanley High School have to go to school all day, and those at home can just lie on the couch and show up to, to, to compete against my, my students. Um, I think he had an excellent point then. Okay, first of all, I just found the tone deafness of that comment and even the apparent ignorance of the homeschooling community completely astounding. I mean, to say that there, as you were saying, Todd, laying around on the couch all day, is she not familiar with the stats that we've seen year after year, clearly showing that homeschooling students outperform public school students by at least 15 to 30 percentile points on standardized tests like the SAT? And not only that, she's also offending thousands of Virginia families in which we've seen homeschooling increase by nearly 50 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going from 44,000 to 65,000 kids. Also, was she also referring to all of those students who are having to learn remotely during the pandemic? Were they also just sitting on the couch and doing nothing? That is a great point. I bet, all, you know, yeah, I bet a lot of them were learning on the couch. That's right. So let's right. be consistent. Well, it is sad that we are behind 35 other states in passing the Tebow bill. What is going on? Why is there so much resistance to this? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. I think that there is a strong lobby for the public schools. And you also have to look at some of these legislators. They come from local school government. Some of them have served on school boards. And so there is that tendency to look at public schools and favor have a little bit more favoritism towards them and not give as much attention to this issue. But, you know, this is a really disservice to a lot of families, especially consider those who are in military and have to move around a lot. This is their only way. They don't put their children in public school because they know that they're going to have to move to another location. This is the only way for them to have their children participate 
and athletics and to get to know people in the community. So I really do hope that next year and, and at some point in the future, we're able to see this bill actually get passed. Absolutely. Well, we're just going to give a quick little wrap up summary about the General Assembly for 2022. Um, but before we do that, I just want to round out these audio clips with a memorable comment from Delegate A.C. Cordoza, a courageous black conservative leader from the Hampton area who is describing his feelings about getting rejected from the black caucus. Let's listen in. Yesterday, one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle said that we want black voices at the table. Well, my black voice came to the table and it was rejected. So, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what I, what I should do. I'm a legislator, I'm black, and I want to help the black community. Maybe I need to start my own caucus, the Virginia non-leftist black caucus. Right now, it'll be a caucus of one, but that's okay. What I think you can learn from A.C. Cordoza's speech is that if you don't meet the leftist views on certain issues, you're not going to be embraced into their caucus or in, into their inner circle. And I think that's what he found to be so dis, uh, disconcerning um, as, he, as he's a freshman legislator wanting to make an impact uh, and represent his, his constituents as well. Yeah, it's almost like they had this ideological checklist that he had to meet. And I think this is just another instance that we are seeing where your ideology, um, your political correctness is more important than your personal character. And, and that's why he was upset about it enough to make this speech. Well, to wrap up here, Todd, give us real quick your summary, your thoughts from this year's General Assembly. Well, I think we, there's a lot to be happy about in this year's 2022 General Assembly session. We saw a lot of bills that would have negatively impacted families get stopped. Uh, one in particular would be the bill to commercialize marijuana and put a pot shop on every corner. Another bill would have to redefine marriage and to include recognizing polygamous marriage. They, they failed. So we, we can really, we're very pleased to see that. Uh, we yeah, saw, and let me just point out real quick. So victories include defeating bad bills. And those were two huge ones that I think we can yeah, praise God for. That's yeah. right. Yeah. In addition to uh, stopping some of the bad bills, we did see parental rights bills. Uh, a couple of them get passed that we right. spoke to earlier in our comments. Um, but at the same time, there was quite a bit that was still left on the table that we were not able to get past. Right. Like school choice school measures, choice, the pro-life stuff. That's right. More protections for parental rights, dealing mm -hmm. with counselors and making sure that parents are consulted before they have conversations with their children about very sensitive topics. Those are things that are going to have to be addressed after we are, you know, after there's a change in the Senate, because right now there is a... Uh, an effort to try to push back against some of those pro-family um, right. values that we hold dear. As you said, um, the Senate became a place where a lot of those good family-friendly bills went to die. That's so. right. <laughs> well, it's that time again. Time for our Inconceivable Moments Award. This is where we're featuring examples of the absolute lunacy and craziness that happens when cultural leaders try to give guidance completely apart from biblical principles. And we're calling this the Liberals' Most Inconceivable Moments Award. Inconceivable! You know, I get a little worried about the state of our country when the definition of the word woman is too much too difficult for a nominee to the highest court in the land to answer. If you haven't heard about this yet, during a Senate confirmation hearing, Biden's nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, Kentanji Brown Jackson, was asked to define the word woman. And she couldn't, or rather she refused to, in fact. Uh, and so you can just kind of listen and, uh, at this exchange. Okay. First of all, does anyone else find it a little ironic that someone who was nominated, let's be real here, we all know why she was nominated because President Biden made a public pledge about it, that he was going to nominate a black woman. That's what he pledged to do. I mean, first of all, he obviously knew what the definition of woman is. Yeah. Um, but then how can you be someone that was nominated in large part for that reason and not know the definition of woman? I'm, I'm not saying she doesn't have qualifications, but let's just be real here. Well, she, sa she says that she's not a biologist. 
That's like me saying I can't comment on whether or not it's raining outside because I'm not a meteorologist, okay? <laughs> Right. I love all those memes going on about that. I can't say whether it's a sunny day because I'm not a meteorologist. And then Piers Morgan also made this comment. I'm not a brain surgeon, but I know what a brain is. <laughs> you know, the uh, the senator that was questioning her, Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee, I kind of wish she would follow that up with asking, well, how many women are actually on the Supreme Court currently? Right. I would love to have heard her response, given that she doesn't know how to define a woman. Right. Hmm, I don't. Oh, I can't determine how many women. Yeah, that would have been excellent, Todd. Um, but Senator Blackburn did an excellent job because one of her points, the reason she asked her that question to define the word woman had a deeper reason behind it. And that is because our court system is directly dealing with a lot of these gender sexual orientation questions. I mean, on college campuses, you know, in a lot of different places, this is affecting women. This is going to have a direct impact on women's rights and opportunities. Yeah, and what actually she's doing is quoting from former Ruth Bader, uh, former Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said that there are differences between men and women that are enduring. Yeah, that was Ginsburg quote from a court opinion, enduring, when we're talking about physical differences. Um, and of course, uh, Black Senator Blackburn asked the nominee if she agreed, and she got a very vague answer. Well, I guess that means we're going to give this week's inconceivable moment to Kentanji Brown-Jackson for not being able to define the word woman. Thanks for joining us for this week's Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. Visit us at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. See you next time. And don't forget, we are stronger when we speak together.